Welcome to the fourth episode of the Film Inventories podcast. Um, quite amazed that I've got this far. Uh, I'm now back at work and busy, but I did manage to speak to a new guest for this podcast in the shape of Paul Hirsch, the supremo Oscar-winning editor of so many films that I love, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Planes, Trains and Automobiles, Still Magnolias, Mission Impossible, several of those. Yeah, I got in touch with him on Facebook and because of the fact that he'd recently written a book, he's still promoting it and was willing to have a chat. We had, we chatted for quite a while and it was really, really exciting for me to talk to somebody who's created some of those amazing films that I've kind of grown up with and I'm sure many of you have too. Hope you enjoy the podcast and I'll be back for some more jabbering on at the end. Hi, Paul. Hello. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. So you're in Los Angeles at the moment? Yes. That's where you live now, yeah? Where are you? I'm in the, the southeast of England in a hotel. Um, I've just gone back to work after three and a half months of having no work. I'm a freelance uh, in the television industry. So um, bizarrely, I'm working on uh, Formula One motor racing. But rather than traveling oh. the world, as I've done for 20 years, I'm doing it remotely from a, a, a hub in the southeast of England. So it's a bit of a change, but I'm in a nice hotel. So it's not all bad. Yeah. Not all bad. Um, so, yeah, the, the podcast I started actually during the, 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 the lockdown period, just to give myself something creative to do, because I'm that kind of person. I've had a few guests uh-huh. on, but I read your book and uh, I've always... Loved oh. your work, and I'm a, I'm an editor myself in Thank television, you. so I have some understanding of of what goes into your work. But I just wanted to be able to, you know, not only tell people about your book, but just to kind of highlight how big a job the editor has in in the movie making process. Because, you know, despite the fact that people think they know what editing is about, I think it still remains a bit of an enigma to people, really. Uh-huh. So I thought, yeah, it'd be just to, good to have a chat with you. So I'll just fire a few questions at you, but I like to kind of keep it fairly conversational as well. And um, I'll sure. do I'll do the intro separate from talking. I don't to know you. how to do it otherwise. Exactly. <laughs> One of the things I always ask people about how they, of course, that inevitable question: How did you begin in the industry? I mean, what was the moment where you saw editing as a career possibility? It never occurred to me until I visited a friend. Uh, from Columbia University, who um, was living in the neighborhood and editing a, uh, a small film in his apartment. I was at the time a student at Columbia School of Architecture, which in which I was pursuing a Bachelor's of Architecture after having already achieved a Bachelor of Arts degree at Columbia. Um, so it was another four years for a second Bachelor's degree. And I wasn't really... <laughs> I wasn't really enthusiastic about that idea. And uh, I visited this friend who had been a student at Columbia also, and he was he'd, he'd rented a, uh, a bench and he had uh, reels and rewinds and a synchronizer and squawk box and a moviola. And the moviola astounded me because this was in 1966. Um, and before it was about, you know, I think the Betamax didn't become available for consumer purchase until 1975 or so. So in this era, there was no such thing as pause or rewind or fast forward. And the idea that you could stop on a frame and look at the photographic image projected individually, frame by frame, I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I thought, wow. And I and I always liked working with my hands. I had, I had spent... Um, five summers as a teenager in um, in a camp uh, dedicated to, uh, it was called Bucks Rock Work Camp. And the idea was that, I don't know what it's like in England, but in, in America, summer camps were always sort of sports oriented and they had a blue team and a white team and, and they'd have these games. And the idea was that the camp would provide um, all sorts of opportunities for the campers to do things. And you weren't required to go anywhere or do anything. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, 
based on the theory that you learn best when the teacher, when, when the student approaches the teacher as opposed to the other way around. So uh, they had an art shop, they had painting, they had sculpture, they had jewelry, they had music classes, they had an orchestra, they had a chorus, they had a dance theater, they had actual theater, you could do set design, you could do costume design, you could do lighting and sound yeah. design. And they also had a construction crew, and I was attracted to the construction crew, and we used to build buildings around the camp. Hmm. We would build uh, bunks for the campers to live in, and, and um, dan- uh, we built a dance studio for the, for the dance uh, group, you know. And uh, so I had always liked, and we, you know, we used hammers, and we would frame the buildings and um, finish them. And I liked working with my hands, and here was... Editing seemed to be sort of related to that. They had all these tools that were cool looking tools. And um, I didn't know what it was, but I, I was drawn to it. And I got a job uh, as a gopher for an industrial film company. And through that, I got a job as a, uh, I was trained as a negative cutter. Uh-huh. I learned the technical end of the business, how to prepare negative for printing. And then talked my way into a job as an assistant editor at a trailer house. And they started giving me work because they were too busy. And it turned out that not only did I enjoy it, but that I had a knack for it as well. Yeah. So I sort of tumbled into it uh, accidentally. But it was sort of, you know, in retrospect, it seems like it was all laid out, you know. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. I mean, you look at something like a moviola and it, it kind of has a relationship to a sewing machine in a way, doesn't it? Because you're using a device that you're sitting at. You're sometimes driving it with your feet as well, right? So it's, it's yeah. quite... Um, I have to tell you a funny story. Yeah. I have to tell you a funny story. When I was uh, working as an editor, in the, in the, you know, as a trailer editor, uh, there was a music editor who worked at the company. And uh, his father had been a tailor. And growing up, he had uh, sworn that he would never, ever go into his father's business. He would <laughs> never become a tailor. He just thought that was the worst. Yeah. And one night, he's working late against the deadline, and he's got trims hanging around his neck. <laughs> and he's working on the movie all, uh, and he's using the pedals, and he's going back and forth. And he suddenly had this image of his father with a tape measure hanging around his neck, sitting at a sewing machine <laughs> and, he thought, and he had the, the grease pencil, you know, and his father had the chalk for marking the hem, hem lines, you know, and uh, he thought, oh my God, I've become my father. <laughs> so it seems like fate does play a hand in there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I worked very, very briefly in the film industry. I was working in the TV industry and I got made redundant from an outside broadcast company and my dream was to kind of get into film. And I went and worked for a company called London Editing Machines who would supply Steenbeck film benches and just about Avid, that period where Avid was coming in and Lightworks was coming in. And I was amazed, having come from a TV background, kind of how antiquated film felt, like with the synchronizer and the rewinder and the film bench. And I was right there on, what was it? It was Tim Burton's Big Fish, that movie with Albert Finney and um, Hugh McGregor. And there, there was like the film bench was at one end of the edit room and the Avid was at the other end. And there were two completely separate teams working on different parts of the movie, some on film, some on, on digital. And it felt like just two worlds that could never kind of, you know, find a, a happy medium because the, the director wanted to stay in film, but the, the technology was pushing him towards, towards, you know, working with video. Did you find that transition difficult? Or did you have more of an affinity with film or did the video situation just give you a better tool set that you were able to improve the speed at which you did things? Um, I did not have any difficulty switching over. Uh, I hired a young guy who, my first film on computers was on, I worked on Lightworks, and it was the the first Mission Impossible movie, and it was in the UK, and I hired a guy named Nick Moore, who went on to greater things than being my assistant. (laughs) Um, But Nick knew the Lightworks, and he would sit next to me, and I'd say, Nick, I want to... I want to pick up this shot here and I want to get out of it here and I want to put it into my cut. How do I do that? And he'd show me and I said, okay, now I want to take another piece. I'm going to put this at the end of the piece I just laid in. How do I do that? Hmm. And he showed me and I thought, oh, so this is like an imaginary piece of film 
then I'm joining to another imaginary piece of film and it's displayed on this imaginary, you know, and they splice this imaginary splice. Yeah. So it all sort of made sense to me. And, you know, when you're building the cut at first, when you're putting together the thing that you're eventually going to edit, um, you're, you're basically repeating a few commands over and over and over. Mm. It's not as if you have to learn a whole set of skills. You know, you, you just learn a few, you know, splice in and, you know, trim or whatever. I mean, there's a few commands that you can do a lot of work with, uh, putting it together for the first time. Did it kind of liberate you to think, you know, I'm, I'm not doing something destructive with a piece of film here that I'm going to have to rejoin. Or if I make a mess of it, I've got to use another print, which is going to cost money. Was it liberating in that sense to use video? Well, I don't know that I thought of it as liberating, but I did think, oh my goodness, I can go really fast with uh-huh. this thing. Mm. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be able to go. I was pretty fast on film. Yeah, I thought uh, th- I'm gonna be able to go really fast, and I was. You know, I mean, I used to on film, I could deliver, you know, regularly ten minutes of film a week. Wow, and that was about what they expected. It was two sh- two minutes a day was what writers were expected to write two pages a day, which was two minutes a day. And film crews were expected to shoot two minutes a day. And uh, I was able to keep up with that so that even cutting on film, I would be able to deliver a cut, a first cut of any picture I was on, or most pictures I was on, always exceptions, but uh, deliver a first cut one week after the end of shooting. Wow. So I'd be able to do that even on film. But um, what happened with with digital was I was able to cut 15 minutes a week or 20 minutes a week or sometimes even more. Wow. Uh, so I thought, yeah, you can go really fast. And the other benefit is that on film, if you wanted to try an alternate version, you had to d- take apart the version that you had. Yeah. Unless you put it out for a dupe and that was expensive and time consuming. So it actually removed some of the tension in the cutting room between the director and the editor because if the director wants to make a change the editor has to destroy this thing he carefully constructed uh-huh. you know? yeah so, uh, but there have been you know um, there have been all sorts of ramifications of the chain of the technology I mean mm. I find that later in my career I came up against uh, um, micromanagement of a kind that I never faced earlier in my career it was in in the sense that you were given the trust to make the cut on film but with the abilities that video offer I guess everyone's got an opinion and they can see that opinion reflected back at them quickly because the fact that you can change it quickly was that one of the the situations not only that but I mean it's evolved now to the point that uh the, people don't screen the cut. They get it sent to. The, they, it's posted on a site, and they can log on, you know, at ten o'clock at night and sit there and pick over. I would get notes from the studio toward the end of my, the end of the last job I worked on. They would say, forty-three minutes and eleven fr- you know, eleven seconds. Could you take a few frames off the outgoing cut, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's no fun. That's no fun. And you're not there to discuss that in person with them, and why you you chose that. Um, extra few frames for for whatever reason and yeah I I mean I work in an industry of course live TV that has that exact same problem you know everyone has an opinion and everyone can pour over it but the the thing I guess with live TV is it the deadline is in two hours you know we have to get this to air um, because we're doing live sport or it has to be now I mean I'm not saying that a deadline is is not as impactful for you as well but um you know, there's a certain inevitability with TV that it kind of, it, it, you have to go to air. But you, of course, have a release date to stick to and you have a, a schedule to stick to. So I guess the same applies. If you're doing live television, mm. any choice you make, it's gone. It's over. You, yeah. There's no second guessing, right? Yeah, true. But, you know, we I do like what's called near live editing. So we're taking in things and we're doing replay sequences and we're doing things that happened just a moment ago. And you're making kind of seat of your pants wow. Um, decisions on this stuff, and wow. you're building highlights ready to roll out at the end of the race as soon as they've got the trophy here's what happened for the race here's a 10 minute package you know so it's um yeah, it's a different i'm impressed by you guys yeah it's a different discipline but it's um 
it's uh, it's a very different kind of editing. I mean, there are still definitely some principles in there that would apply. You know, we're, we're all good at kind of chucking images together quickly to make sense of them and, and tell a story. And that's ultimately, whether you're a film editor or a live sport editor, that's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to tell the story. Um, I was thinking when you're talking about the transition there that, of course, George Lucas was at that f the forefront of the transition when he came up with like edit droid um, at Lucasfilm, oh, yeah. um, putting things on laser discs. And if George hadn't been pushing for that. I don't think the transition that ever would have happened. I mean, I guess eventually it would have, but he was definitely a, a force pushing in that direction. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I mean, he's an editor himself, really, isn't he? By you know, self, he describes himself as an editor more than a director. That was um, that was kind of his his forte as such. I mean, you worked with George Lucas, of course, before that, Brian De Palma. I mean, you've told this story, I mean, many, many times, I'm sure. But just describe to people that are listening to this podcast that you you met Brian De Palma and how how did that relationship kind of transpire? And then moving to George Lucas, there's a connection there, wasn't there? Yeah, well, George and Brian had become friends in 1971. Uh, when they were both working on the Warner Brothers lot in um, in L.A. George was from Northern California and had gone to USC in Los Angeles. Brian was from New York, and they were both uh, on the lot there, relative strangers, and I think they were the only two directors on the lot who had beards. They were young guys <laughs> with beards, and that was something significant <laughs> at the time. But anyway, they became they became friends. George was making a feature version of a student film he had made, THX 1138. And Brian was working on a picture called Get to Know Your Rabbit, which was about a, a, a traveling magician uh, with Tommy Smothers and Orson Welles was in the picture and Timothy Ryan and a bunch of other, uh, Catherine Ross was there and mm -hmm. I forget who else, John Aston, I think. And anyway, um, they had met and become friends. Brian and I had met when I did the trailer for Greetings, a uh, picture he directed uh, that my brother had been a uh, producer on. My brother produced two pictures, and then his career went in other directions. But anyway, while he was producer, uh, I got hired to do the sequel to Greetings, um, which was called Son of Greetings, and eventually became Hi Mom. And that was my first film. I was 23. And then Brian and I hit it off. We had this, uh, you know, wonderful, uh, close friendship at first. And um, he was 28. I was 23. We were both learning our jobs and uh, growing at the same time. And he taught me a lot because he was, you know, he was five years old. And he, he, he knew a lot more than I did. But he he trusted me a lot and he encouraged me and he empowered me and he was really um, great support for me. And, you know, I am um, very grateful to him. And I had done five pictures for him before I worked for anyone else. Hmm. When I was working on Carrie, um, he and George had been casting. Brian, uh, George was doing Star Wars at the time. And... Uh, he and George had cast the same range of age range of actors in Los Angeles. So they had these casting sessions together. Mm -hmm. And um, so they'd become quite close. And then uh, George went off to shoot Star Wars in England and Brian was in LA shooting Carrie. I was in New York putting the picture together. And then when George finished principal photography, um, they let their... English editor go because George was unhappy with the cut. And he and Marsha came from London through New York on their way back to California. By that time, we had a cut of Carrie and we showed it to them. And um, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from Marsha asking if I could come out and, and help on the picture. And my wife had just become pregnant. She was, I think, was one month pregnant at the time. <laughs> so I said, well, I have to check with my wife. And Brian heard this and he said, what? what you, don't <laughs> he grab the phone. He said, Marsha, he'll do it. You know? <laughs> we're, we're, we're paying him this much. Can you afford that? Great. Okay. It's set. All right. <laughs> and then uh, he turned to me. He said, don't tell her your problems. Just say yes and work it out. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, so I went home. I went home and I said to my wife, "Well, honey, you remember that picture that I was telling you about? Because I had heard about Star Wars, mm-hmm. and George had expressed an interest in working with me. And I said, "Well, he wants me to come work on Star Wars." And she said, "Do it." When they wrapped principal photography, they moved from London to San Anselmo, which is in Marin County. Okay, but by this time, had John Jimson done his kind of assemble edit, assembly edit of the film that George kind of wasn't happy with? Was it was were you brought on board to kind of help rescue the situation there, as far as you could see? Yeah, I mean Richard Chu and Marsha Lucas were the editors on the picture, uh-huh. and I guess when they started recutting the picture they realized that they weren't going to meet the deadline unless they had more help. Mm-hmm. And that was when I got the call. Um, I was surprised that J- that Jimson hadn't worked out because, you know, I had seen uh, Hard Day's Night and mm. and The Knack. Did you ever see The Knack? The yeah, Knack yeah. Brilliant. yeah. It's quite punchy. Both, um, well, both those films are, aren't they? You know, very punchily edited. And, yeah. 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 Some of the scenes were overcut. Some of the scenes just lay there. There was no pace to them at all. There was no consistency to the to the outlook on the film, and things were just you know bad cuts that didn't match. And it was just sort of a, a careless job. It seemed careless. I, I don't know. Yeah, I've seen I've I've seen some of it. Yeah. I've heard that you have seen some of it. Yeah, there was a few little bits released um, many, many years ago. There was a there was a CD ROM, um, Star Wars archives or something, and somehow somebody in the archives snuck on these. There was like a snippet of the cantina scene, for instance, and it's just. I mean, it's you know, it's got uh, on set audio on there, and there's no music and things, but it's just without any atmosphere. Every take is just two beats, three beats too long, and there's no connection between the characters. They lose that kind of snappy talk around the table when they meet Han Solo. And it's like it lingers too much on the, the alien characters in there. Um, it's almost as if he, in his mind, it was like, well, they've put all this effort into this. Well, we need to show it rather than concentrating on yeah. telling the story, maybe. I don't know. But did you, had you seen any of it when you, when you arrived then? Had, or did you just get to work on the sequence that George Well, no, I mean, we, this was... This was you know, time is wasting. Let's get going. You know, we're, we're we're working against the deadline. And George was spending half the week down in Los Angeles with ILM trying to get ILM off the ground mm. and half the week in Northern California where we were. And uh, we were coming up against the deadline, having to show the picture to the studio. And I said, I'd like to screen the cut. And George said, no, forget that. Just go, Just grab the next reel and start recutting. So there's no time, you know, so... <laughs> uh, that's what I did, and then Marsha was busy working on the end battle. Mm. She was still building the end battle, uh, and she was using black and white uh, World War II aerial footage uh, for the to, uh, as placeholders for the external exterior shots in the battle. Was that from a particular film, or was that just kind of stock footage? Uh, I think it was from everywhere they could get it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it was stock footage. Just something that represented that what what he wanted in terms of speed and the dynamic movement of of those ships, I guess, as a guide for ILM. No, no, more about timing. No, or? no, no. <laughs> it was <laughs> each shot had a number scribed in the corner of the first frame. So, if you're looking at the sequence, you'd stop, you'd pull out the film, you'd read the the number scribed in the corner of the first frame, and you refer to a big log book, and you'd find out 435J, let's see, 435J is exterior Vader's ship coming toward camera. And you'd look at the shot, and it would be two Jap zeros going like this. Huh. It had nothing to do with with the, the action that you were going to see, but it was just some movement up there sure. to represent... It's an exterior shot. There are going to be spaceships here. And this is approximately the length. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was all you could tell. The action was had nothing to do with the eventual action. Wow. It must have been so difficult to kind of piece that together, um, you know, physically, let yeah. alone in your head, to kind of imagine what might be coming out for, for release. Absolutely. And you had to refer to all this paperwork constantly because you huh. couldn't just cut the film qua film. You know, you had to figure out what it, what it was going to be. Yeah. 
So anyway, so Marsha was in working on that for weeks, you know, trying to puzzle this all out. And then Richard and I were busy recutting the picture, um, sort of leapfrogging each over each other. If he had one reel, I'd go to the next available reel and uh, sort of like that. So uh, at a certain point, the deadline for the end battle came. It's coming up very soon. And George pulled me off the recutting of the reels. And he said, we got to finish. We have to lock the, the end battle. So he broke it into two halves. He gave was really like two thirds. The first two thirds he gave to Marsha. Mm -hmm. And the last third uh, he gave to me, which was Luke's trench run, starting with, I guess, uh, when Red Leader crashes on the surface of the mm, Death Star. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it goes all the way through uh, Vader chasing him and Luke hearing from Ben and, you know, mm. that, that whole business leading up to the explosion of the Death Star. So uh, I worked on that. She worked on the first two-thirds, Gold Leader's run, and I forget what else, you know. Um, and then at a certain point, we had to join them and lock the sequence for real because the studio wanted to cut the end battle. They were afraid of going over budget. And they said, George, they get there, they rescue Leia, picture's over. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> and he said, and he said, no, it's not just rescuing Leia. They have to, you know, so... He was determined to have his end battle, and he wanted to get it into the pipeline as soon as possible so they they couldn't cut it. They, you know, it was like, we have to sp start spending money on the end battle, so it would cost the money to cut, cut the uh, sequence. Mm -hmm. So that was with the emergency of having to do it and do it early. So we spent a few, uh, two or three days, I think, uh, tag teaming the sequence I would sit at the Steenbeck, or the cam rather, and George and Marshall would sit behind me on the couch. And mm -hmm. then after a couple of hours, uh, I, you know, I'd get up and Marsha would drive, and I'd sit next to George. And so the three of us, uh, Marsha and I, taking turns driving the machine, or the three of us put our heads together, and we locked the um, the sequence um, for ILM to work on. It's incredible because that sequence, if you kind of break it down from an editing perspective, it is. It may sound naive to say this in a way because all films are made up from editing, but it, it is very much an edited, constructed sequence. And it feels like it was made in the edit, that sequence, very much. You know, it wasn't necessarily made in, in George's mind or in the writing because you've got all those crossovers of all the radio chatter. You have the effect shots. Um, you have the intercutting between the attack and then back on the rebel base watching the, um, you know, the movement of the Death Star and all that kind of stuff. It really feels like um, it was hard work, potentially. I mean, it works fantastically and it's a sequence I've seen, you know, hundreds of times. But was it was it hard to work on that sequence, particularly because up until that point, the movie is kind of edited in, you know, I don't want to say a typical way, but a way that, that an audience in 1977 would traditionally understand of how a story would progress. And then it gets to that last bit and that tension just builds and builds and builds, you know, while everything is stripped away from Luke and, uh, you know, in the end he's victorious. But it feels like a real ramp up at that point. Was it, a, was it the most difficult sequence to, to cut, do you think? Um, I, we were so, I was so busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the whole time I was there that I, no particular sequence stands out as the most difficult. Mm -hmm. But but uh, when you talk about the tension, one of the things that uh, we addressed um, early on was uh, we realized that we didn't have enough material to create the tension that right. we wanted. So when we thought about it, you know, the thing that I learned from working with De Palma is that tension or suspense depends on a clock. You need to have the sense that time is running out. Uh -huh. And famous story of high noon, you know, uh, the picture was flat, didn't work. Uh, the editor, I think his name is Elmo Williams, came in and uh, said, we got to shoot the, the clock on the, on the church. Mm -hmm. 
So every once in a while, he'd cut back to the clock and it was now, you know, 10 minutes to 11 and then it was 11.05 and then it was, you know, and he kept jacking up the tension so that eventually it got to be high noon and the train arrived with the killers who were going to kill Gary Cooper. Anyway, so the, the suspense that depends on the clock, the feeling that time is running out, that jacks up the tension. Mm. And we just didn't have enough material uh, to do that with. And we didn't, we hadn't figured out a way to create the sense of time running out. So what we did was we shot, George shot um, the extras in stormtrooper costumes, uh, pulling levers and turning dials and, mm -hmm. and, and moving faders and uh -huh. uh, all these sort of little bits of uh, action that were meant to represent uh, how the Death Star annihilated a planet. And we put these pieces that he shot, this is during post, we put these second unit shots uh, into the sequence where Alderaan is blown up. So that then at the end of the movie, we could reprise those same shots and the audience would understand that we were getting close to the moment when they were going to pull the trigger and blow up the planet. Mm -hmm. So um, that was one of the things that we picked up in in post in order to generate the tension that you described. Yeah, it's such a fantastic sequence. I showed my five-year-old daughter um, the film uh, a couple of weeks ago during lockdown and she she was just holding on to me at that point. She just wanted reassurance that everything was going to work out. Too you know? scary for yeah, she she's okay with it. She was okay. no, she was fine with it. She's kind of because I, you know, I grew up with Star Wars, so I've still got my Star Wars figures in a case on the wall. She knows the characters and things, so she had a familiarity uh, with the story. But she, yeah, nice. she was she was just like you know, white knuckle on my arm kind of thing because she wanted to make sure that it was going to turn out all right. And that's that's what you do in editing, isn't it? You you sort of lay the um, the, the uncertainty out in front of people before you sort of draw it all back together. And Star Wars is one of those fantastic films where everything feels just so satisfying at the end. You, you, when Luke breathes that sigh of relief, when he just fires off his torpedoes into the chute and he goes, he sort of exhales, you kind of do it with him and you realize you've been holding your breath all along. So uh -huh. all credit to, to you guys for, for, for achieving that for the audience. I think that's the, that's the, um, the power of editing though isn't it because without your job what you do i mean people probably don't realize just how rubbish dailies can look you know you are constructing a performance of, a, of an actor you are constructing the story um do you how, how much of i mean in stars you described there that obviously george was there marcia was there and you were being driven, you know, along with them, how to put this story together. How much involvement does a director generally have on a picture? Are they with you day in, day out? Or are they, uh, does it change? I mean, I'm sure it changes from director to director, right? Well, that that's the point. Yes, mm. it varies as much as people vary. Yeah. You know. Some uh, are quite content to, uh, I call it being chauffeured around, mm. you know. And others like the pleasure of driving. So, um, it you know, it depends. Uh, Brian was very much in charge, as was George. Uh, Brian was not terribly um, uh, nitpicky. Mm. He gave me a lot of gave me a lot of freedom, a lot of autonomy. Uh, George, having been an editor, was more nitpicky, but you know. I guess because it wasn't my work in the first place, it didn't worry me too much. You know, I, yeah. I shared his dissatisfaction with the original cut. Mm. Um, and uh, when I started working with Herb Ross, Herbert was a great director, but he would say, well, that's your art. You know, when yeah. I, he, he, he didn't, he didn't interfere too much with the editing part. I mean, the conceptual stuff, of course, uh, we would we would get into and you know we we worked on a picture that i did four pictures with him three of which worked and the one that didn't work he was very much you know in the editing room trying to huh. you know we're pounding on it trying to make it work uh but when it was working he was content to to, to let me be a uh, sound editor that i worked with quite a lot of man named wiley statement um told me that 
the pictures that he did with me. He worked for me uh, on the John Hughes pictures mm. and on the Herb Ross pictures. And he said both Hughes and Herbert never showed up. Hmm. He said, to me, you were the director on those pictures because they weren't interested in, you know, they would show up for playback at the mix. But in the meantime, all the, the choices that had to be made were, you know, you you were the director as far as I was concerned. And I huh. hadn't thought about it that way. But like you say, it varies from person to person. Some yeah. some directors uh, care very much about what frame you cut on and some don't. It's the same in my industry. I work with producers who want to tell you where to put every single cut. You work with other producers who just give you that trust that, okay, they're the editor. They know the best thing to do in this situation. They might want a few tweaks here and there. So it does come down to trust a lot of it, doesn't it? And obviously you you earned George's trust because you were then hired on The Empire Strikes Back. But working with another director, Irving Kirshner, I mean, was, was Kirshner somebody that was in the edit room a lot? Um, well, no, because uh, Kirsch, um, Kirsch was busy shooting the movie. Right, yeah, of course, because you were engaged from the start with this one, of course, yeah, right. From the outset. So uh, the schedule was for 16 weeks in... London in Boreham Wood mm -hmm. and after a week Gary Kurtz said to me he says well we're not going home June 3rd it'll probably be June 10th and then I said okay you know and then a week later he said well it'll probably be the end of June huh. and then a week after that he says well it looks like more like middle of July <laughs> and every week the, the deadline would be pushed back like 10 days <laughs> so so uh, the shooting was uh, quite slow and very easy for me to keep up with the volume of film that was coming to me. Mm -hmm. um, I would be done sh cutting the previous day's dailies by two in the afternoon huh. and wander up to the set and say, how you doing? You know, and they say, what are you doing here? I say, I I've run out of film. I need more film. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Kirsch was... They shot 29 weeks, scheduled for 16. They went 13 weeks over schedule. Mm. And uh, for tax reasons, I went back to the U U.S. Uh, after 26 weeks. If you, stay 20, if you stay 183 days, you have to pay U.K. taxes. Uh -huh. So I went home one day short of that, so... I went back to uh, California, or on to California. I wasn't living there at the time. Mm. And uh, they kept shooting for another three weeks. And then um, I showed the picture a week after that, after Kirsch came back from England, and we showed it. And uh, George liked to run the picture twice. He looked at the whole picture twice. Mm -hmm. He looked at it once. Nobody took notes. We just ran it and watched and then the same day he would run it again and then people would take notes. And we met in the cutting room. Uh, after that it would be uh, Kirsch, Gary, George, Marsha, myself, Larry Kasdan. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. And then we went through the picture reel by reel. And uh, I was, you know, whenever somebody had a problem, we'd stop, we'd discuss it. Mm -hmm. I'd make notes and we'd go on and then I make the changes and uh, then we screened it again and we locked the picture within four weeks. Wow. I think we had a lock after four weeks. Wow. So um, Kirsch didn't really have time to be in the editing room mm. terribly. Everything that everything that Kirsch asked for, he got. Right. I mean, whenever he, he objected to something or brought up an idea or whatever, uh, George would say, fine, let's do that. Mm. So uh, I think Kirsch was quite happy. Mm. I think I heard you talk in one interview about um, Kirsch saying, watching people struggle, but human, human effort is boring or something. So you cut some of the scenes of Luke struggling in the yeah. snow and things like that. Yeah, it was, it was Han. It uh, was, was Han it? dragging Luke over to ah, the okay. tauntaun. Mm -hmm. And he, he held up this long bony finger and he said, Physical difficulty is boring. <laughs> I, thought, I thought he's right. You know, yeah, it is boring. 
I, I've, you know, I, I made some of my own kind of behind the scenes documentaries about the original Star Wars films, again, just to kind of teach myself editing and things years ago, and poured over some of those deleted scenes. And I don't think there's a single one I've ever seen in Star Wars or The Empire Strikes Back that I felt should have been included. All of them feel like they were the perfect things to take out. Was there anything in either of those first two Star Wars movies that you wished had remained that, that, got, that got removed for one reason or another? No. No. I just read an article uh, that quoted Mark Hamill as saying that he felt that uh, cutting him out of the first reel of Star Wars was a mistake. And uh -huh. I thought... I disagree. I'd never heard that before. Mm. It's funny here to be hearing that after 43 years. And Mark had given me this really nice blurb for my book. So mm. I was really kind of surprised. But I think he's, I think he's on shaky grounds given the success of the film. I mean, you yeah. can't really yeah. complain that it, his character was gutted. You know? Yeah. Um, I understand him feeling that way, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a genuine concern. The, uh, I, I was, I was surprised and, um, when, when George redid, you know, the special versions mm. and he restored the scene that we'd cut out, which mm. is, uh, job of the hut at the, uh, millennium Falcon. Um, I just thought it was a scene that was unnecessary. Absolutely. Because he was essentially re repeating everything that, that Greedo had said in the cantina sequence. I was going to say, I forget the order of things, but um, yeah. uh, no, I don't regret anything being out. I just remember, I just regret things coming back in. Yeah, yeah. Well, that one, you're absolutely right about that being a repetition of the scene that preceded it. And it felt to me in that 97 release that it was almost there as an experiment to see if he could create a digital character in Jabba and you know looking towards what technologies he could use for the prequels it felt like an exercise rather than actual uh, you know a, a genuine creative need you know I think there was talk about you know George was always wanted that scene in there and you know, there was talk of a stop motion character in one of the documentaries being superimposed over the Irish actor um, Declan Mulholland. But I, for me, it always felt like it, it was just completely unnecessary, that scene. So when we were cutting it, he said to me, I'd like to replace this guy with a creature. And I thought I thought he was joking. I thought that was the funniest idea. I thought, <laughs> well, you know, how, how comical, you know. Yeah. But he really meant it. Right. And he, and his his mind is just 20 years in the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was waiting exactly. for it to catch up with his imagination. Blimey. But he actually explored it at the time. He said that ILM said they couldn't do it because at one point uh Han jabs mm. uh Jabba in the chest and he's wearing a fur yeah. uh outfit and his finger went into the fur and they couldn't pull a a, a mat line when the mm. finger went into the fur. So eventually the technology caught up with the desire. Yeah, yeah. How um, how does an editor go from making, you know, I mean, I looked at your list of films again today. I was telling some of my colleagues who I was chatting to this evening and you look at the films that you've edited and they're all definitive films in their genre. You know, you've got Carrie in horror, you've got science fiction, fantasy, Star Wars, you've got... Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off as the kind of teen movie. You've got Planes, Trains as uh, the comic. They're, they're films that kind of defined my my life in many ways. You know, I was brought up on these films, <laughs> and they define those genres. But one one of the things that I was really interested to know is how how do you how do you make that leap from cutting an action movie to cutting a comedy movie? Is there a difference, or is it still? I mean, what is there something special about you that's able to do that? I mean, because to me, a comedy movie couldn't be further away from, you know, an action movie or uh, a science fiction movie. Yeah, I've always felt that if you're a good editor, you could cut anything. Hmm. You know, uh, that you know, if you're doing a dramatic film, you make it as dramatic as you can. If it's funny, if the intention is to be funny, you make it as funny as you can. If it's meant to be exciting, you make it as exciting as you can. Mm -hmm. um, I always felt that anyone could do anything, but I discovered that's not true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that in order... <laughs> that in order to uh, cut comedy, you have to have a sense of humor. And there are certain people who just don't have a sense of humor. Absolutely. So <laughs> uh, I, uh, I do have a sense of humor. And uh, so, you know, comedy was fun for me. The first picture I cut was a comedy. Mm. Uh, Hi, Mom. 
Um, you know, people were surprised when De Niro did uh, analyze this or, you know, some or um, some of the comedies he started doing later in life. And I thought I knew he was good at comedy because I saw him do it in his 20s. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off recently again. Again, it was one of those movies that my sister and I would just pour over again in the summer holidays, you know, in, in the school school summer holidays. We just watched those movies again and again. And that one was a, a particular favourite. And there's still a real freshness about that movie. And it's got, for me, it feels like there's something like it's just, it's got a fantastic heart, that movie. There's nothing kind of cynical. It's kind of enjoy life. Do what you need to do. Just enjoy yourself and don't be an asshole, basically. It was meant to be a companion piece to 16 Candles. Mm. 16 Candles was meant to be the worst day in a teen, a teenage girl's life where everyone in her family forgot it was her birthday. <laughs> and it was the worst day of her life. And Ferris was intended to be the best day in a teenager's life. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it's it is a very uh, uh, sort of loving look at um, being a young person and recognizing that uh, young people are people mm. above all mm. and individuals. And um, yeah, it's a it's a wonderful picture. That's what John Hughes was very good at, wasn't he? It was just kind of treating kids like people and just kind of identifying with them and trying to help them understand their world. You know, I think that's uh, one of his fantastic traits and, and sorely missed. We, it's almost, I, I wish he was still about because we kind of need that right now as well. Just, yeah. just letting kids be kids. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm going to show my teenage daughters that movie when I, when I get back home. Um, that's going to be one of our movie nights in the coming weeks. So there's, there's so many movies that I've just been dying to show my kids, um, you know, when they get to the right age. And I think they're, they're, they're kind of ready for Ferris Bueller now. You froze for a minute. Uh, I think my hotel internet connection is, is being a bit rubbish. Um, I was just going to say you, you worked with uh, Joel Schumacher on, on Falling Down as well. I mean, that's another film where... Yes another fantastically edited film and the tension, the tension that builds um, towards the end where the world is kind of closing in on Michael Douglas. Was that, was that something you enjoyed editing? It felt, it feels like there's a certain joy in that process there. If I put myself in, in your shoes. Well, one of the unusual things about falling down was that it is the picture uh, with the least amount of footage I ever worked on. Oh, really? Joel, Joel shot less than any other director I ever worked with. Huh. And some days, often there would be 30 minutes of dailies, tops. And uh, he would shoot two takes and move on. And sometimes he'd do it one take. Wow. In fact, there's a key scene, there's a key moment in the film where Michael Douglas has taken a gardener and his family uh, hostage momentarily. Mm -hmm. They're hiding from police helicopters in a pool house in a rich section of Beverly Hills. Uh, that's, that's a uh, pleonasm, isn't a rich section of Beverly Hills. But anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, they're hiding. And it's the moment when you realize uh, that Michael Douglas plans to kill his former wife and family. Mm. And uh, there's a long, slow push in on Michael. Yes. Um, and, and Joel shot one take. Wow. And he even cut too soon. So I had to use, I had to cut out him saying cut and use every frame I could until Michael broke character because he was still feeling the moment huh. after Joel said cut, you know, and I wanted to extend the shot because it was just, very powerful emotional moment. And uh, I said, what, you know, how come you didn't do a second take? He said, I knew we had it. Wow. Not even said, for yeah, insurance. Well, the negative had gotten, <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah. I said, what if the negative got scratched or something? You know, he said, I, I knew we had it. So I said to him, I said, you know, it's very interesting to me that you shoot so little. And he said, I'll tell you why. 
the reason I shoot so little is because dailies are so boring. <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> yeah. And is that is that kind no, of but... empowering for you as an editor then? Because you kind of know what you've got to work with and you know, I mean, you get notes, right, from, from the director saying what their favourite take was or whatever, the, you know, but they kind of leave it up to you to a certain extent. But if you're not having to go through reams and reams and reams of, um, of footage... Is, does that simplify the process or does it make it more difficult because you've got less options? Sure. No, I mean, it, ma it makes it simpler, of course, because, you know, uh, I'm just saying that, you know, problems have solutions. If there's no solution, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. So if you're limited to one take, well, okay, that's the take. There's no, there's no problem. <laughs> you don't have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. No problem. And that moment you talk about with Michael Douglas, though, and just using it all the way to, you know, to the, the shot cut. It's, it's one of the most satisfying things that I find in the, you know, the very different kind of editing that I do is just finding those little moments that you didn't expect were going to be there as well. Yeah. Those little moments that you suddenly put it in between two other shots and suddenly it feels completely different. I mean, you talk in your book about how yeah. in Obsession you took that sequence. Well, you, you can describe it, but there was a sequence you took and, and put a different spin on it, which changed the entire movie. Yeah. Well, there was this problematic scene and we turned it into a dream sequence by preceding it with a shot of Cliff Robertson asleep. So the events that took place in the scene, we said by doing that, we said this really never happened. Whereas in the original film, it, ha it actually did happen. Mm -hmm. The objectionable scene. I don't want to spoil it. No. You know? So, um, yeah, we made it. You know, we put a shot of him asleep and then we showed the objectionable scene. So the audience could take comfort in the fact that these events never really occurred. They were just in his imagination, a projection of his desire uh, and his obsession. Mm -hmm. So an illustration of his obsession with the character of Jean Jean Bujol. Um, yeah, editing is, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I have said that the work is so absorbing that I sat down to work and 40 years went by. Yeah, you know, yeah. So. Well, I've just had my 20th anniversary doing what I do and it feels exactly the same. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that I always think about when I edit my stuff is that, you know, if I'm editing to a music track, which you don't, I guess, because the music comes afterwards often in, in, a, in a film, but, or, or if you're editing- well, a it depends. Yeah, I guess there's, there's exceptions to that rule, but, um, I also think that if I, you know, I've edited a few short documentaries of interviews with people. Um, I, I did a little sort of 30 minute one about Robert Watts, um, who worked on Star Wars as a oh, yeah. production manager and sure. producer and things. Robert. And I spent an hour and 20 minutes with him. And it was great to have that mm -hmm. amount of time. Um, but I spent, you know, several weeks on and off in between paid work editing it and I, f I you end up feeling like you have a relationship with these people you kind of know them in intimately because you you see all their little ticks and their quirks and their speech patterns and yeah. you get to know them and I mean for you working and pouring over you know tens of hours of footage you must feel like you create a relationship with them but it's a kind of one-way relationship isn't it because you don't get a chance to for it to be reciprocated I wrote about that. I wrote about that very phenomenon. Yeah. In in the book. Yeah. In my book, a, a long time ago, in a cutting room, far, far away. And it's a great book, I have to say. I thought they'd get the plug in while I could. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. Um, I had written that that about that idea that you know there's this intimacy with the actor that the, it's only the actor doesn't know you from Adam, mm. you know, uh, because you're just working with the image, but. I talked about it in the context of Charlize Theron's performance on Mighty Joe Young. Mm. My literary agent showed it to a reader, a young woman, who took great exception to this description of my watching, you know, Charlize and knowing, you know, her every movement and uh -huh. running her back and forth for weeks and, and becoming you know, intimately acquainted with everything mm. that she was, you know, she would do. And she described it as it was creepy that some dude was watching this actress, you know. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> it wasn't intended in that way at all. It was, 
It's how you, how you, you know, how you read things, how you see things. So in the book, I made it neutral. I just said the actor, and I didn't talk about Charlize mm. in particular because that added an overlay of something. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, really, what you're talking about is is you're you're getting intimate with the rhythms of that person and the way they move and the way they gesture and the way they talk and project themselves and the intonation in in, in the way they speak. That's the kind of yeah, and you're, intimacy you get, isn't it? And you run them back and forth, oh, and you yeah. put you cheat syllables into their mouth, uh-huh. and you play things over the back of their head, and you know you do all sorts of things. And um, but it's really no different uh, from a fan meeting a star for mm-hmm. the first time. You know, mm. they feel like they, you know, a star probably meets people all the time who feel like they know him. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but it's just a. It's a one-way fantasy. Uh, have you had any um, actors be in the edit with you um, during, you know, doing your going through your editing process on a film that kind of want to guide you through their performance? Yeah, I've I've come across that. You don't uh, have to name any, obviously. But... Yeah, Bill Paxton on on Mighty Joe Young oh. uh, uh, had he came in and he said he had shown the picture to a friend of his who was an editor. And I got very, uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't like that. And he teased, he teased me for being jealous, you know. Who is this guy? What does he know? <laughs> yeah, occasionally that happens. Uh, and another picture I did more recently, a uh, star came in and um, we did his cut. And he had very good ideas, but they were the wrong ideas. Mm-hmm. They're good, but they weren't right. Mm. You know, this is, get the distinction. But he wanted everything to go very fast, and uh, so we did it. You know, and the great thing about um, avid editing is you can have an alternate cut and not yeah. disturb the real cut. You know, so you save that and you put it that aside, and we do a whole version, the speeded up tempo that he was looking for, and uh, it was an interesting experiment, but it didn't work because there are all these moments that have to land. And if they don't land, the picture doesn't work, you know, so you have to, the times when you have to slow down for the audience to get something because if they don't get it. They're not going to get the next thing, you know? Mm. So, yeah, you don't hear many actors thanking their editors. Do you really? It's uh, hardly ever. Yeah. Uh, who was it? Was hardly it? ever. The only one I can think of Lupita Nyong'o, was, uh, I heard Lupita Nyong'o. Yeah. Was it her? Yeah. Was it 12 years a slave? Her Oscar? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Kind of, I remember watching it that night, kind of going, "Well, I've never heard that before." But it's it's funny, isn't it? Because you know, so much of what you do really crafts their performance. It, it absolutely uh, sure. shapes their performance. And as you say, you can put words in their mouth. You can you can change the way they react to things by putting in a different cut. And how much now then, with with say Avid, are you not only manipulating you know the rhythm of the edit, but you're actually manipulating the image itself? Because of course now. You know, when you shoot on high resolution, you can punch in on a picture and, and, and things like that. Is is that part of the editor's yeah. responsibility these days? Sure. Mm. Yeah. Although I've I've retired now, so yeah. Um, I don't I haven't been in the editing room in a couple of years. I'm devoting myself totally to the book and promoting it, and, mm. and uh, I've developed a um, um, kind of a hobby on Facebook corresponding with people around the world, people such as yourself. I had a, uh, an interview with a young man in Sri Lanka recently, which was very exciting to me. The idea that you could sit face to face with somebody uh, halfway around the world. It's actually 12 and a half hours time difference yeah. between LA and Sri Lanka. Huh. So he and I were talking like you and I are talking. Mm. Uh, I mean, even this is amazing. I'm yeah. talking to somebody face to face and, in the UK, it's really the age of miracles and wonders, as well as the worst of times. Yes. So. Um, yeah, it's amazing to me that I'm talking to the man who cut like you know, five of my top eight movies. You know, it's. Uh, <laughs> I was telling my parents before before we came on who I was going to speak to, and uh, yeah, they're like, "Oh, good luck," you know, because you're. In, you know, I've spoken to a few people that have worked on some of these movies, but I've never spoken to a person who has had such a big. Uh, such a large impact and 
um, has, has you know crafted crafted the movie and because I have that slight understanding of what it takes to put something together it still blows my mind that you you guys and girls you know back in the 70s and 80s were doing this on film and still producing things that today still look fantastic still look fresh still feel um, you know they have that kind of visceral feel to them that I love those kind of 70s and 80s movies I'm not a big fan of current movies these days uh, big pictures anyway um, uh, you worked with um, well they don't make anything original anymore well this is the problem yeah this is the problem you worked with um, obviously like a, a second generation director in Duncan Jones um, he he obviously yeah. grew up with the same he's a similar age to me I think and he grew up with you know some of the very similar influences what was it like for working with, with somebody who is kind of seeing you with those glasses on if you like um, well, I love working with Duncan. He's a very sweet man and, uh, um, you know, he makes interesting pictures. Uh, he deferred to me a lot on source code because, well, he's, he tends to be deferential. He'd only done one picture at that time. Yeah. And, uh, um, he knew my, you know, my CV and <laughs> I guess he felt, and I would say, well, what do you want to do? You know, and he would say, no, no, you tell me, you know, <laughs> I've hired so, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But uh, yeah, he was he was wonderful to work with. And uh, I was very happy to work with him on on Warcraft mm. uh, as well, although I had problems with the script. And the problem with big franchise pictures is that there are so many elements politically. Uh, there's, you know the game people who invented the game, they have, you know, big say in what goes on. And then you had the studio and then you have this sort of heavyweight producers to reckon with. Mm. And so, um, Duncan and I were sort of, you know, <laughs> up against some very powerful elements. Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting. You think now here's a, picture with a budget, you know, well north of $150 million. I don't know how much it eventually cost. You think, think of the freedom all that money gives you, but it's the opposite. You know, uh, they spend so much money that they're the, there's all these other people that, that weigh in on it, you know, so yeah. you don't have as much freedom at, at all, especially when you're doing so many visual effects shots because the, the visual effects people always you know, want the shots way in advance. So they have time to work on them. Mm. So they'll say, you know, during production, we need to deliver, you need to lock in 150 shots a week. You need to turn over to us 150 shots every week while you're still shooting the movie. This is like building the plane while you're flying it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I keep saying, uh, we don't, how can you lock in the picture, lock a sequence till you see the picture, you know? There's going to be a lot of waste. And they say, well, we know that, but we need to have the shots, you know. Wow. So we turn over 150 shots or 200 shots every week. And then uh, at the end, you say, well, where are the shots? And they say, well, they're coming. They're coming, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> and then they deliver them, you know, 200 shots. You have to cut in like crazy and there's only weeks left to go and you can't make changes because, you know, it's very limiting. It's not it's not the kind of freedom you expect with all that money, mm. you know. Well, it's interesting that most of those youngish directors of that generation, I think of like Gareth Edwards, who, you know, did Monsters and then he did a Godzilla picture and then he did a Star Wars picture. I hear now that he's going straight back to his origins and making like a small independent movie because exactly what you described is, is something that he came across as well, where, you know, it wasn't quite the top of the mountain that he was expecting. You know, it was it was uh, too much, too much control was taken away from him rather than the other way around. Um, yeah, it's very yeah. limiting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was, you know, I will say to, you know, anybody that's listening that they should absolutely buy your book. I, I not only bought the, 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 the hard copy, I had it on Audible as well, because I, you know, was traveling oh. a lot of the time. So I've, I've, I've read it a couple of times and I've heard it a couple of times. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm just so interested from, to hearing your point of view, you know, I've read books by Walter Murch and I've read, um, 
the 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 Osteen books, you know, uh, the uh, cut to the chase and things like that. But yeah. it's always interesting to me to hear different opinions on on editing and what it takes to be an editor. And what do you what do you see? What how is there a way you can boil down what you see your responsibility as as an editor? Well, I think you're there uh, as a truth teller to the director. You know. Uh, there's an, ex- there's an expression, you can die of encouragement. You know, people say, great, great, great. You're doing great, you know, as you're going down the tubes. Uh, so uh, I think it's my responsibility as the editor to tell the director when I think something's not working. Uh, some appreciate it, some don't. Mm. Um, but I think it's my job. And then if I insist on my point of view, it's with the idea that the director in defending his position feels more confident of it because it's been challenged. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing them a service. I'm doing them a service, even if I'm challenging their position. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think I'm there to, to, uh, I always tell younger, I trained my daughter to be an editor. She's an editor now and say, you know, when, keep your mouth shut until people ask your opinion. And then when they ask your opinion, Tell them what you really think. Uh-huh. Don't don't offer it unless you're asked. But when a, when asked, say what you really think. Yeah, that's good advice, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I had um, I put a couple of uh, questions. Uh, I asked people to to give me some questions as well. If there's anything they wanted to ask you uh, on my Twitter account, and one of the questions that came up was something I'd be interested to know. Whose idea was it in Star Wars to do the the wipes? Was that an editor's idea or was that George's or was it a kind of collaborative thing? Well, I had always liked wipes. If you see um, um, Hi Mom, which is my first film, uh, it's got a lot of wipes in it. Mm. I mean, maybe not a, a lot, but it's got maybe half a dozen wipes in it. And, uh, you know, when I was working on trailers, uh, I would go to the optical house and they would have a display of all the wipes that they could supply you. I don't know if you've ever seen these charts. Mm, yeah, the little kind of thumbnails of, yeah. Yeah, little thumbnails of the wipes. And they would have mm-hmm. you know, left to right, right to left, up, you know, mm-hmm. up and down, mm-hmm. uh, curtain this way, curtain that way, mm-hmm. uh, a diagonal wipe this way, diagonal wipe this way, and so forth. And somebody, one of the directors I work with called it the flags of all the nations. <laughs> they had a, you know, yeah. That's exactly what it looks like. 50 or 60 different wipes you could do. Iris in, iris out, black core, white core, you know. So I was sort of fascinated with all that stuff. And um, I liked doing it. I thought, you know, the wipe is a a solution to the problem of how do you get from one static image to another static image? Mm -hmm. So, um, or, you know, how do you get from a moving image to a static image or from a static image to a moving image? Mm. And... It, uh, I always liked the solutions that they afforded. And when I started working on Star Wars, um, the film itself had been based on Saturday afternoon serials from the 30s. And the wipes were a convention of that time. So it's sort of a natural, you know, I, George and I sort of agreed that wipes would be cool to use in the picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember what the idea was, but, you know, mm. that's the thing about collaborating with somebody on a film. Lots of times uh, you don't know whose idea was whose. Yeah. You know, you come at the day you've done something and uh, you're not really sure whose idea it was. Mm-hmm. It might have been his, mine, I don't know. We were working together and this is what we did. And uh, it's that sharing of, uh, of the job together that results in, you know, I was telling people, the most successful pictures I ever worked on were cut by me and the director. Mm-hmm. Period. You know. Yeah. I mean, we get we get input from, you know, from from we get reactions from people and and make, you know, and make moves based on that. But um, but you know, we the, the way it works now with the, the meetings with the the creatives, I'd like to know when creative became a noun. <laughs> <laughs> I feel your pain yeah yeah I know the exact feeling you're right though because you know if you're working just as a as a pair in your case editor and director 
even those outside influences, they're all being funneled and filtered through the two of you, aren't they? So that, you know, it's your reflection of that opinion or your opinion of that opinion that kind of comes out the other side. I find the larger the team I work with, the more difficult it is to come up with a decision. Um, and as I said, with live TV, that decision needs to be, you know, yesterday. Yeah, so I just wanted to to thank you for your time, Paul. And, you know, I absolutely recommend the book. It's it's a real insight thank into you. a part of movie making that I've always been fascinated with. And, um, you know, really grateful. I have a question for you. Go on. <laughs> How was the reader? The man who read the book on, on the audio book? Well, it's interesting because I know, I, I've, I know your voice because I've seen you talk a couple of times, you know, on, on documentaries and things. And I... I knew it wasn't you immediately, so that was initially jarring. Yes. But I have a bit of a weird relationship with um, with the, with the readers on 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 Audible because you've got a voice in your head when you read a book, and I read the book first, uh -huh. and I had an approximation uh -huh. of your voice with the kind of the slight New York twang in the background there, and um, so yeah, I found it a little bit jarring initially. But what I also found is it was a a very nice way for me to re-experience the book without having to have it in front of me. You know, if I was out and about having a walk or on a journey or, or something like that. So uh, was it, they, is it somebody that, did they, do they consult you on that or do they just no. take it and run with it? Yeah. Well, they, they made it, they, they uh, it was sort of like a, a kabuki version of consultation. You know, <laughs> it was, was not for real. Yeah. It yeah. Was, um, Anyway, yeah, I was just curious if it was successful. Yeah, no, it worked. It worked for me. But I, you know, as I say, because I know your voice and I know it wasn't your voice. It was yeah. a little bit jarring. But uh, yeah, I think I, I'm always slightly forgiving. Like one of my favorite authors, um, a Japanese author, uh, Murakami, I always find it very difficult hearing an American accent reading a Murakami book because in my head it's a Japanese accent. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of audiobooks, but they, they serve a purpose for me if I've read the book and I want to revisit it but don't have the time to, to commit to sitting down. But, yeah, I really want to thank you for it because it's a fantastic book and I absolutely recommend that people buy it. I never intended it to be instructive. Uh, my, my purpose was just to tell stories, share stories. And, yeah. you know, the, the stuff that I find interesting, you know, was some of the creative challenges that we faced and how we solved them. But I, I didn't intend it to be a how-to book. No, but know? it's instructive but through I, it experience. I am, I, am I, gratif I am gratified that people are able to learn things from it. Mm. I mean, that, it's not something I planned, but I'm, I'm glad that, it's, that it has happened. Yeah, know? I think the learning is yeah. through, through your experiences and the, way, and the way you tell them. And, you know, having, a, having a, somebody talk about their craft, who is a master of their craft, is always something fascinating to read, whether, whether they talk about theory or, or whether they talk about their experiences. And anyway, I'm going to leave you to it now because I'm grateful for your time. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. And listen, if I'm in LA anytime soon, I'd love to come and interview you on, on camera and, and make a little short film about you too. So um, maybe okay, one day. Okay, well, it'll have, have to be outside. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm talking about in, you know, in a world that used to exist, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Inshallah. Yes, exactly. Thanks, thanks for your time, Opal. Really appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out. Thank you. Take care. All the best. You too. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to my conversation with Paul Hirsch. There, really grateful to Paul for giving his time and uh, having a good chat. And, you know, I found out some things there that I didn't know, even about some of the films that I've geeked over for, for many, many years. Next time, hopefully, I'm just planning it now, I'm going to have Kevin Pike, who started his career on Jaws and ended up being the man that helped create the DeLorean for Back to the Future. I interviewed Kevin before, actually, for my Inside Jaws filmumentary, which, if you want to see it, is still available on vimeo.com on the Filmumentaries channel. I should also thank all of my lovely patrons on patreon.com who have donated to enable me to do things like this uh, podcast and the videos that I make. If you would like to make a subscription donation, then please visit patreon.com forward slash Jamie Benning. And uh, yeah, there's several tiers on there. There's a couple of free gifts of posters and things if you donate a little bit more. 
And I'm, yeah, forever grateful to everybody that does that because it really does mean that I can take a day off and get some of this kind of stuff done. So thanks very much and I hope you can join me next time. Thank you.